It'd be great if you're able to uh, keep <clears throat> your uh, Bibles open. And you'll, if you like uh, writing things down, you'll see inside your newsletter there, there is some space for you to <clears throat> write some stuff down. Uh, I'll pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your promise to speak to us uh, through your word in the Bible. And we pray that in these few moments now, you'd please give us open ears to hear what you're saying and soft hearts that are willing to respond. We ask it for the glory of Jesus. Amen. Well, how good is it to be able to meet live and in person? Uh, we went back to uh, the church I'm going to for our first Sunday on November the 7th. It was great. It was really good to be able to sing, to be able to talk with people. It was wonderful. Uh, sometimes uh, we see things that are wonderful in, uh, in our church, things that are just simple things that are just so encouraging. And I think of uh, some of the people from uh, Glenmore Park, the church that uh, I was at. There was the older couple who kept uh, Tuesday and Thursday mornings free so they could come to our church-run playgroup and chat with the parents and, and the other people that uh, brought kids along. Uh, there were the mums who kept uh, Tuesdays free so that they could teach scripture, so they could teach SRE in the, uh, the local primary schools. Uh, there was the school teacher dad who after a massive week at school, he would turn up to help lead our Friday night youth group so we could chat with the students and help them figure out all the questions that they had about Jesus. Uh, there was a builder who each Saturday morning he would organise a group of his mates, they would go for a bike ride and they'd plan for a stop at one of the cafes along the world, they'd sit down and have a coffee and again look for opportunities to talk about Jesus. There was a family who uh, regularly invited their neighbours over for a barbecue or for coffee or for lunch or, or, or for dinner. It was to get to know them, but it was also so they could have conversations with them uh, about Jesus and invite them to events at our church or to even come to church with them. There was a group of men and women who kept the first Saturday of each month free uh, so we could go to our local shopping centre and we could talk with the shoppers and we could hand out information about our church and we could invite them uh, to our church just like you guys are planning to do in the week coming up. Why do people do these things? I mean life is busy, life is full, there are obligations and there are so many commitments. It was because they knew Jesus. Jesus changed their lives. Jesus changed their priorities, he changed their thinking about what is important. I mean, life is busy, isn't it? There are so many important things, sport, work, education, family, rest, house. But all these people knew there's nothing more important than Jesus. There's nothing more important than people hearing about Jesus. For them, Jesus has changed everything. But has Jesus changed you? Jesus changes everything, but has Jesus changed you? Now in that Bible reading from 2 Corinthians 5, we see how the Apostle Paul has three powerful motivations, three powerful motivations for us to be speaking about Jesus. Chapter 5, verse 14. Christ's love compels us. Knowing Christ's love, it drives, it pushes, it motivates us to talk about Jesus. Number 2, chapter 5, verse 20. We're all Christ's ambassadors. Therefore, we want to do everything we can. We want to do anything we can to live and to speak in such a way that everything about us helps everyone around us to be able to know Jesus. And number three, chapter six, verses one to two, the days are urgent. The days are urgent. And gripped by this urgency, we'll want everyone to know the grace of God that is found in Jesus. So there are three reasons why knowing Jesus means each one of us should want to speak about him. Christ's love compels us. We're all Christ's ambassadors and the days are urgent. So let's briefly think about each one. Firstly, Christ's love compels us. Chapter 5, verse 14. Christ's love compels us because we're convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves 
but for him who died for them and was raised again. A few years ago, a, a ship, the Green Lily, uh, was caught in a ferocious storm off the coast of England. And just so you know, I was chatting to someone after the, uh, the earlier service this morning. You want to know, these are, these are real pictures. These are not Google. These are pictures. What I'm about to show you are pictures of the event that actually took place a, a number of years ago. Uh, suffering from engine failure, that ship was drifting towards the rocky coastline. Uh, a Coast Guard lifeboat was sent out to uh, rescue the crew, but in the violent storm, 10 metre waves pounding the ship, the ship couldn't get uh, alongside the stranded ship. So the Green Lily soon ran aground. A helicopter was uh, brought in to uh, rescue the crew. Uh, with a storm ranging, a helicopter winchman, Bill Deacon, if you Google, you can read about him, he volunteered to be lowered to the ship. He would attach a winch to the crew uh, who in their terrifying circumstances, one by one, would be raised up to safety in the helicopter. Uh, braving huge waves and gale force winds, Bill Deacon made sure that each member of the crew was rescued. Sadly, and this is where the story turns to tragedy, with the last man in the helicopter, a huge wave washed Bill Deacon off the deck of the ship into the ocean before the winch could again be lowered. And the next day, Bill Deacon's body uh, was found and he was posthumously awarded the George Cross Medal for Bravery. I want you to imagine that you're one of the ship's crew from the safety of the helicopter where you have been rescued, you look down and you see this huge wave come across the deck of the ship and you see it wash Bill Deacon into the raging ocean after he has saved your life. How would you feel? I mean, having experienced such a rescue, you can never be the same. You'd live with gratitude, with thankfulness for the man who saved your life, especially after he gave his life in the process. Now, how much more is this true as we consider Jesus' great rescue for us, his death on the cross? Why is Jesus there? Why, why is he on the cross? Jesus' sacrificial death on the cross, it's no accident of history. It's because of love. Uh, despite the fact that none of us have loved God as we should, despite the fact that in some way each of us has rebelled against God, ignoring him, not listening to him, Jesus loves us. And so often I get into conversations with people, they'll ask me, well, how do you... How? How do we know that Jesus loves us? Well, Jesus proved his love, rescuing us from an eternity without God by dying on the cross, taking our punishment from us turning away from God. This is amazing. Chapter 5, verse 14 tells us that this is Paul's conviction. And see that word that's underlined there, conviction, convinced. Can, and I wonder if you can see what God is saying to us this morning uh, through the Apostle Paul. Paul is persuaded, convinced that Jesus loves him. He's convinced that Christ's love took him to the cross. He's convinced that in Jesus' death and resurrection, Jesus makes available this forgiveness for any person who would turn to him in repentance and faith. Chapter 5, verse 15, Paul is convinced that because of Christ's love, those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. Everything is now about Jesus. Motive, goals, dreams, ambition, desires, plans, time, thinking, lifestyle. Because of, because of love, everything changes. It's a huge reset. It's the greatest news without any exaggeration in the history of our world. For Paul, this love, this amazing love, it drives, it pushes, it motivates him to speak to the world around him, to speak of Jesus' saving love. <clears throat> when you held your toothpaste 
when you took your toothpaste in your hand this morning when you cleaned your teeth, and I hope you did, I hope you did, <laughs> and you squeeze that toothpaste to make the toothpaste come out of the tube, there is only one way that the toothpaste can go, isn't there? There's only one way it can go. Likewise, now the love of Jesus has changed everything. There is only one way that Paul can go. Like the toothpaste, Paul is compelled, he's pushed, he's motivated by Christ's love to, to live and to think like this. Like the toothpaste, I want to urge you, let the love of Christ push you forward and spur you on, motivate you to share this good news. Paul, the Apostle Paul, values this more than anything. Not, not the things of the world. Not the things that are here today and gone tomorrow. But Jesus. Jesus who is eternal. Jesus who loved him. Jesus who laid down his life for him. In Jesus we are made new. We have a fresh start. We have a new agenda, a new program. And Paul is convinced about this. I want to ask you this morning, are you? Are you convinced about this? Now, for some here this morning, it might be a new thought, uh, a new idea you hadn't really thought about, uh, like this about Jesus' love. And I want to say for you this morning, it's a good day to say thank you to Jesus, to respond to him uh, and to respond to Jesus' love by following him and by trusting him. Realising that uh, following Jesus is not just a good way to live, it is the only way to live. Uh, and talk to someone about this. If you've got those sort of thoughts going through your head, talk to Marty. He'd love to chat with you about it. For others here this morning, being convinced about Jesus' love uh, means, being, it means being refreshed, reinvigorated, reminded, ah, this is what life is about. This is what life is about. I want you to soak it in. Like Paul, be convinced, be persuaded of what this love does, how the love of Jesus changes everything, of the urgent need for our world to hear about Jesus. Well, how do we respond? How do we respond to this? What do we do? Pray. Pray for God to change people. Pray for God to provide opportunities for you to speak with people, for opportunities and conversations at the shopping centre. Uh, in the lead up to Christmas, pray for boldness. Pray for wisdom to know what to say. How you might be able to invite them to church. How you might be able to invite people, your neighbours and friends and so on, into your home. Show hospitality. We can do that now. Ask questions. How are you going? Offer to pray for people. Offer to read the Bible with them. People are much more spiritually hungry uh, for truth and, and life and hope than we actually realise. Uh, listen to where people are coming from. Be ready to talk about the difference that Jesus has made to you. Keep praying. But I need to ask you, have you yourself turned to Jesus? Have you responded to his love? Do you know his love? Have you put your trust and hope in him? Asking him for the forgiveness he brings? As I said today, it's a great day. Let me urge you, if you haven't, take that step. But see, this is how Christ's love changes everything. Number two, where Christ's ambassadors, chapter 5, verse 18 to 20. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he's committed to us the message of reconciliation. We're therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. Ambassadors have been in the news a bit recently, haven't they, with the whole France-Australia submarine thing. Being an ambassador is a big deal. You represent your country. You speak for your country. Uh, but in the first century world, there's no satellite communication. There's no Instagram. There's no Facebook. And the, of, the king couldn't be everywhere. So the ambassador would represent the king. He'd deliver the king's messages. He'd make announcements on behalf of the king. And I wonder again, can you see what the Apostle Paul is saying to us this morning? 
as Christians, followers of Jesus, we are Christ's ambassadors. And what is the message we deliver? What's our message? Well, it's a message of reconciliation, a message of peace, a message of hope. And why do we need this message? Well, here are the facts. We simply do not treat God as we should. We don't give thanks to him. We don't honour him. And rather than trust him and look to him, we trust and look to the things of the world. And rather than depend on him, we, we pretty much live independently of him. We so often live as if he doesn't even exist. And it's sin. This is sin. It cuts us off from God and makes us enemies with him. And the result? Well, despite all our technology and all our education and all our wealth, our world is a mess. Anxiety, depression, division, addiction, greed, violence. Our world has lost its bearings. Our world laughs at God mocking him, but yet our world is full of fear running around the darkness looking for lasting hope and lasting peace. But see what God has done. On the cross, chapter 5, verse 19, God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. On the cross, chapter 5, verse 21, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Right here, God is saying something massive. It's, it's extraordinary. It's, it's just life-changing. Once you and I were enemies with God, but now in Jesus, we're friends. We're reconciled with God. Once all we knew was guilt, fear, shame, now we have peace. Now we have hope. I've sat with growing men and women with tears streaming down their faces, overwhelmed with joy and relief at this great news. The removal of fear, the removal of guilt. Knowing that God is for me and not against me. Knowing that I have a future that I can look forward to. This is the message we are privileged to deliver kind of gives you goosebumps, doesn't it? Chapter 5, verse 19. God has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. If you are a Christian, a follower of Jesus, you are Christ's ambassador. It's an incredible privilege, but it comes with significant responsibility. God is saying... That through each one of us, he is making his appeal to the world for reconciliation with him. This is what it looks like, that when you walk out the front door, when you get in your car, when you get on the bus, when you go on the train, when you go to the gym or to your club, when you walk into the shops or your workplace, when you go into your classroom, when you run onto the sports field, as you chat with your neighbours, the things that you talk about, the decisions you make about your future, where you will live, the job you will take, how you use your time, how you will spend your retirement, how you set up your home. You're Christ's ambassador. It's all of life, isn't it? You represent Jesus. You have the answer our world desperately needs. So can I just, as we sit there now, can you... Think about the people that God has brought into your life. Can you think about the people that uh, God will bring across your path? Neighbours, work colleagues, the parents of your kids' friends, the people in your club or your group or your team, uh, the people you meet and see at the shops. Will you prayerfully look for opportunities to share the love and good news of Jesus with these people? And as you pray, be ready, ready to see how God will answer those prayers. So number two, this is what it means to be Christ's ambassador. Number three, the days are urgent. 
chapter 6, verses 1 to 2, as God's co-workers, we urge you to not receive God's grace in vain. For he says, in the time of my favour I heard you, and in the day of salvation I helped you. I tell you, now is the time of God's favour. Now is the day of salvation. Uh, several years ago, Bruce Willis was in a film called Sixth Sense. Has anyone seen Sixth Sense? Yeah, cool. Uh, in the film, Bruce Willis was cast as a psychologist. Now, if you've seen Bruce Willis in his Die Hard movies or some of his other movies, you're thinking, Bruce Willis is a psychologist? Give me a break. Really? <laughs> but in this movie, he met a boy who could see dead people. It's a very powerful movie because it reminds me, as I see people in my street, when I go to the shops, when I hang out with friends, when I go for a walk or have a coffee at the local cafe, it reminds me, and this is where it gets heavy, unless these people have put their trust in Jesus, they're just like dead people. People destined for an eternity without Jesus. And I, wow, this is heartbreaking. And it should create within us a sense of urgency because they're people who desperately need Jesus to give them life, real life, eternal life. Uh, back in uh, chapter 5, verse 10, Paul reminds us that we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. If you're a Christian, if you're someone who's put your trust and hope in Jesus, appearing before Jesus on that last day, that is something you can look forward to. We can look forward to. Wow, finally to be at home with our Lord. What a joy that will be. But for anyone who's rejected Jesus, who's not accepted him, who's not put their trust and hope in him, that last day appointment, it's a terrible thing. This is why in verse 11, chapter 5, verse 11, Paul says, Since we know what it is to fear the Lord, we try to persuade others. As best we can, we prayerfully, we lovingly try to persuade others to turn back to Jesus, urging them, stop rejecting him. Respond to his love. Respond to his offer of forgiveness, his offer of reconciliation. And talking to, Jesus, talking to people about Jesus is not just the hobby of some or for the extrovert or for the specialist or for the minister. Knowing we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, knowing this sense of urgency, knowing that Christ has loved us, knowing we're all Christ's ambassadors, it means it's the responsibility for all of us who call ourselves Christians. It's not an optional extra. All of us are called to share the good news of Jesus. Let's go back to the, uh, the wrecked ship, uh, the green lily. If you're a Christian, you were once a member, a crew member of that ship. You were once a crew member of that ship. And now having been rescued, you can never be the same. How much more is it true that from what God has been saying to us this morning that Jesus has changed everything? Jesus loves you. He's died for you. Your sin is paid for. You're reconciled to God through Jesus. You're Christ's ambassador. You're God's co-worker. All because of God's amazing grace. Jesus has rescued you. You can never be the same. But consider this. Our world is on that ship. People living in uh, Waitara, Hornsby, Warunga, Mount Kola, Asquith. People you know are on that ship. Family, friends, work colleagues, people in your club, your team. And again, it's heavy. They are in danger of perishing. I'm spending an eternity without God. The clock is ticking. The ship is about to break up. Their lives are about to be lost. But remember, we know the winch man. We know the one who can save them. We know the one who can rescue them. We know Jesus. Therefore, will you prayerfully look for opportunities to introduce them to Jesus so they can be saved, so they can be rescued by him? 
Can I remind you as I finish? Three reasons to speak about Jesus. Christ's love compels us. We're all Christ's ambassadors. And the days are urgent. I'll lead us in prayer. Let's, uh, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for Jesus. Uh, we thank you for his amazing love. We thank you that in Jesus our sin is taken away and we have peace, reconciliation with you. We have forgiveness. Thank you that we're made new. Thank you for the privilege of being your ambassadors, of being able to speak of this amazing love, hope, peace and reconciliation. And as your ambassadors, we pray that you would please help us to honour you in all we do. Please give us that sense of urgency. And we pray for this, our church. Please help us to be well equipped, ready to speak your word of life to a world so desperately needing it. And we ask it for the glory of Jesus. Amen.